I've been in dogs since 1991. We breed dogs that we want to train. I was out here in Western Nebraska riding Harleys and training dogs. Now you don't sugarcoat anything, and if you don't like it, tough. Welcome to another episode of the Flatlander Kennels podcast with Chris Jobman. Today, we're going to do another Q&A segment. We're kind of running low on questions. So get on over to the Facebook group, put your questions down. I'll make sure they go into a document and I'll send them over to Chris and we will get them answered. So Chris, how are you Correct. feeling this evening? I'm doing good, man. We're pounding through these things and I'm doing good. And I think our next few episodes after these are all done, we're going to do some, we're going to have a very special guest on. And then we'll talk, you know, maybe more about uh, the next um, step in our flow chart, which would be um, many the water T is swim by. Yeah, well, that's right. We need to get back and, and yep. get at that. And guys, if if you are online and you see people asking questions, you know, what's a good training system? What's a good training program? Remind them these long form audio podcast that chris does on the different steps of his flow chart i took georgie through e-collar and force fetch just based on chris's audio alone he was over on the duck on podcast with me and jordan fromer when i was over there and that's all i used i think those long form audios where it's a whole hour step by step are for me better than a 20 minute video so as you're training your dogs remember these flow charts man we chris goes in depth on it and you've got the facebook group to ask follow-up questions so don't be afraid to use that um as your sole source for training because i can tell you i, I did it on both e-collar and force fetch and it was it was phenomenal so don't forget about that are you ready to hit up the questions now let's roll all right let's do it this one is eric nilson for handling on blinds and considering factors, when to give a verbal, when to give a silent cast, and when to give a step or not to step. This is a good question because everybody does this a little bit different, um, and it all a lot of this varies on the factors. So, the rule of thumb is verbal drives, and for changing direction is silent. Um, I talked about this in depth before is the big loud booming overs 99.9% of the dogs go straight back because they heard a voice. So it drives voice drives to momentum and voice really drives to crappy momentum. So if you have a dog that's fading with the factor that is fading with, let's just say it's fading with the wind. The wind is right to left really, really hard. It's fading with the wind It's going left. And you stop it, you try to give a right angle, but you go verbal, you go back. I guarantee you that dog will fade and, and scallop with that wind. Voice drives to momentum. So anytime you want a change of direction, that is silent. And I and I'm typically as a handler, I'm very, very silent. I don't make a whole lot of noise and use my voice unless I need it. Um and it, it is hard. So when, when you want to step or you don't step. I do a lot of bumping and sliding. So I'll give like, when I say about that, I'll give a right straight back and I'll just slide right. And what I'm telling the dog to do on that is just to bump over a few degrees and go back. Okay. I'm just bumping and sliding right straight back, slide right, left straight back, slide left. I'm just bumping the dog around. Now, when I want a 45, I will stop the dog, give a 45 and I'll usually give a big step. Okay. Now, if you're casting into the wind, that's when you want to move and give a big step and move and, and really communicate with the dog that you want them to fight the factor, get into the factor. Really communicate. This is what I want you to do. Now, if you're going to cast the dog with the wind, I wouldn't give it much of a step because if that's where the dog wants to go to anyway. You're really going to move the dog there. So just maybe not as much movement with the wind, more movement into the wind. Same way with hills. You want to cast up the hill, you give a, a lot of movement to the right up the hill. Casting down the hill, not much movement because that's where the dog wants to run anyway. So you got, and you also have to know, understand and know your dog. So voice drives, change the direction or silent, move into the factor. Don't try to move as much with the factor, um, that sort of things. Um, 
And all it, those things it, probably need to be thought out before you even attempt it. Correct. Like, is the wind correct. going? Look at the hill yep. and really thinking through it. Yeah. And when you get in those situations, and, and like you're in the, say you're running in the trees, you're running in, you know, keyhole blinds, you're in the trees and it's really dicey in there that you can lose your dog real, real quick. Don't make the mistake of, you, you say you give a cast, a left back, and, does, and the dog doesn't move, and don't go back. Well, that dog is going to, whether it sees you or not, and make damn sure it sees you before you do that, if it doesn't see you, as soon as it hears back, it's going to go darting through the trees, and you've lost it. You're done. So when, when things get really, really dicey and tight, and you're trying to really feather a dog through something, I always am almost always silent. Mm-hmm. Because make sure, because if they move and they see you, that makes sure they see you. They, they know, you know that they see you. If they don't see you and you give a big verbal back, who knows they're going to shoot off. So when it's really tight and dicey, I try to stay really silent and just bump them around in there. On what scenario do you give them a big verbal back? Do you ever do that? Um, not very often. Um, I, I very seldom. Now, if I'm trying to, you know, push them back up into the, up in the, into the wind. I might, um, if I'm trying to maybe push them across the water or into a piece of water, give them a straight back, a verbal back. Um, maybe if I'm trying to punch them through a tree. So I'd, let's just say I, there's a, there's a, there's a keyhole blind, right? It's 10 feet wide and they're running pretty good. I give them a left angle to try to push them through there. They miss it a little bit to the left. So I stop them. I give them a right angle. And they go a little bit more right of the where I need to go. I stop them again. Now my next calf is my next cast is left straight back verbal. Mm-hmm. I, so I I gave you that you went left. Now you went right I silently. Now I'm going to go verbal, which I'm hoping to drive you straight back through that pit, through that keyhole. Yeah. Okay. And another thing I like to do too is sometimes you go, you'll get stuck in that weird position where the dog is in line to the blind and then you blow the whistle. And it stops directly in line to the blind. You're like, oh man. Because if you give a right back, it's going to go right. You give a left back, it's going to go left. It's not going to go straight back. Because mostly straight backs are gone. Most dogs take an angle of some sort. And so what I like to do there is I'll just give a verbal back and I won't move. I won't, I won't lift my arms. I won't move. I'll just give a verbal back. And a lot of times those dogs don't spin straight back and go straight back. Yeah. And that's what I'll do. So, so I, 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 see, I see you thinking, I see you thinking. Am, well, you had to really fix some things with me about my verbal commands yep. on blinds and something I've been finding myself do lately. And I, I want to know whether this is correct or not is when she hits a peninsula um, on, on a tech pond and I, and I give her a silent left or right back. She doesn't, she, she's not overly confident to turn and charge straight into the water. Sometimes she'll turn and then, run the bank a little bit before getting in and then her angles kind of off. So I, I found myself giving her that hard back in those situations. Um, right or wrong. Wrong. And, and here's why I, I, I was, I was going to say, right. But, and, but when you said that she would go over the point and then try to go around the bank, right. She likes, so, she's just not like, I just want her turning and charging into the water. Right. And sometimes so, cause but, the water's been a low, you'll even lose her. And, and you see her, Angling, clear off some yeah, stupid. So what, what you need to do on that is is when that happens, when so, so say she gets on there, you need to write straight back. So you give a right straight verbal back, or excuse me, silent back to get off the water. But then she goes over the over the point, and now next thing you see her, she's kind of skirting to the left, trying to cheat the water. Mm-hmm. So that's where you need to call her back up on the point, nick her, give her another silent back cast. Okay. Yep. See what I'm saying? Yeah, she's she's giving into the fact that she's trying to cheat. Mm-hmm. Because here's what a lot, well, a lot of times what people do. I've seen this happen a thousand times. They'll get on a point like that, and they'll give it right back, and they'll go back. Next thing you know, that the dog wants to cheat already. That throws them into a huge cheat. More of a cheat. Okay. And then, and, and like I just said, it, voice drives to momentum and shitty momentum. When you go mm-hmm. back, and they'll they'll spin that way, but then they run around the they run around the corner of the pond. So there's a lot of times with that aggressive and my back, as you know, is extremely aggressive. Sometimes you tease yeah. me about it. With back! That, it, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it drives them even harder into their mistakes. Correct. Yes. Cause it's going to drive them hard and they do what they're going to do anyway, but now they're doing it. Yeah. And now, yeah. And then it just voice drives. 
So it, okay. when training, you really need on Georgie, you, if you want them to go over that point, what you really need to teach them to do. This is going to sound crazy. This is what everybody usually does is when they're swimming through a point, this is going to be, this could be a whole podcast right here. But they're swimming up to a point. What's everybody do? They let them get up off the point. What's everybody do? So the line to the blind or the mark is through the water, on a point, across a point, back in the water, across the pond. What does everybody do? They swim across the water. They get on the point. What does everybody do? They blow the whistle. Right. And they try to cast them off the point. Why would you blow the whistle? It, it, she's going the right way. Mm -hmm. So then, so now you blow the whistle on the point. You try to cast them off the point, And it all turns into a bunch of goo. And you're not teaching the dog anything. The only thing, you're the only thing you're teaching the dog to do at that point is pop on the point. Every time they get on a point, they pop. Mm -hmm. Waiting for you to help them. If they're if they're getting off a line a little bit coming into that point, you stop them in the water. You give them the literal cast to get on the point. The literal cast to get on the point to go over the point. And if they're taking that line right, let them get off the point. Now, now you're teaching a teaching thinking dog. Now it's got off the point in a good spot. Now if it goes way left and it pops up in a bad spot. Fine, stop them, give them a light correction, call them all the way back, all the way back into the water before they got on the point. Stop them again, small correction, cast, same exact cast over the point, and let's see if the dog carries that line. So if, if, if she's having an issue going across the points, then instead of stopping her on the point, I need to stop her in the water before yeah, she Yeah, because you're not teaching line. her how to cross a point. Right. You're teaching her to stop every time she gets on. A yeah, and now you're getting into this weird. She wants to cheat the bank. So let's work on her. Te let's teach her how to get out of water and think her way through this. Hey, I ninety nine point nine percent. If I do this, I get back in the water. I keep going. Because hey, you're not a, actually right now. You're not teaching her to do anything. Yeah, I'm just driving her further into her mistakes with my vocal. Correct. So now, if you, she gets out on the point and you see her. Go left. The second you see her go left, the second you see her make go left and make that decision, stop her. Mm -hmm. Stop her. Cast her silently. Give her a small correction because she gave into that factor. She's on the point. She's the second you see her. Now you stopped her in front of. Let me let me rephrase this. You stopped her in front of the point, mm -hmm. and and because she's veering a little bit. Now if she's going straight into the point. Or let her go until she makes makes a mistake. And but then bring her clear she, in front of the point if she makes the mistake? The, I, I'm not there yet. Okay. So so let's do this. So she's swimming at the point. If she, she's going dead straight, let her go dead straight. Then you you interact with her when she makes her decision. You you correct it. Let's just say she's veering a little bit left. Say the blind is at 12 o'clock. She's veering a little bit left at 11 o'clock before she's getting on the point. The second you see her veer a little bit left before the point you stop her, you cast her. You put her back up on the point. Now she's doing a really, really good job. And now she sees the water to get back in. The second she sees that water, let's just say she veers a little bit left, stop her immediately. Because she has made the decision to, to run around it or not take enough. The second you see that, stop her immediately. Give her a correction. The literal cast to put her, not the over, but the literal cast to put her in the water to finish the line. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. You every decision she's made, you you you're you're teaching her what you want. Now rerun that blind, maybe add a mark, come back and run that blind again, and now do it again. And now there, now here's the thing. Here, let's just say she goes out of the point. She's swimming to the point. She gets out. Great spot. She runs across the point. Great spot. She gets back in the water. Great spot. But the second she gets in the water, she's going a little bit left. She's like, ooh, I think. But you've lost sight of her, right? You've lost sight of her. Let's just say she comes up at le at eleven o'clock to the left. She got she did a lot of things right except for the very last. She got on on the point, off the point correctly. She made a bad decision once she got off the point. That is when stop her at eleven o'clock, call her all the way back to you in front of the point. Cast her again. After you give her a correction again, you can either recall her all the way to you, or you can recall her all the way in front of the point. Give that right back cast. And let's just see if she gets off that point and carries that cast. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is a completely different. This could be a 
five series seminar on this stuff, but um, on, on all that and how to teach. I mean, I love my training philosophy is how to teach a thinking dog. I love a thinking dog. And if you make all their decisions for them, you don't have a thinking dog. You have a robot. Yeah. And you're trying, you are making all of her decisions for her. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You I'm, look I'm confused. Glad that, I'm glad you, that came you, up. No, your wheels are turning. Well, I well, I'll tell you what I was thinking. I was thinking that in that AKC test, when she had a problem on her second mark, she got to that peninsula and she stopped on it. And I was wondering, could <laughs> that be because of the blinds? If I'm always stopping her on a peninsula, could it? Be she ran back to the old fall. She ran back to the old fall. But that's what my wheels were turning about was just thinking. Yeah, but, but I, I got what you're saying completely. But I, just, I, I see so many dogs here when they come to the kennel and all of our tech water, they get off on a point, and the first thing the handler does is blow a, point, is blow, blow a whistle. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Well, he was going to – like, did he or was going to? Mm-hmm. If he does, then you get involved. If he hasn't yet, then what are you doing? You're not teaching anything. You're, just you're not teaching anything. Right. You know, it's like you can tell your kid, hey, don't touch that stove. It's hot. Don't touch. Well, you don't go ahead and touch that son of a bitch. Yep, that's hot. You'll never do it again. <laughs> right. You know, there's a teaching right. moment, you know, so it's the same right. thing. No, yeah, that, I, 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 that makes total sense. I've got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I went off out. on a tangent there, but I hopefully answered that question about the, the verbals. Well, I try to say, I try to stay as silent as I possibly can until I actually need them. Yeah. So. Well, this one, is, this is a big one this next one. So it's going to be interesting to see how you answer this one. This is back into a lot of verbal stuff. Can you talk through your verbal and nonverbal communication and cues from the holding blind to the blind, to the line, lining up for the marks, memory birds, recognizing poison birds, blinds, long, short, checkdowns, obstacles, old falls, diversions, wipeouts. Just curious what words and cadence you use for each of these scenarios and what body English is the most effective body language? Uh, examples of how you're talking to your dogs, moving around, pushing, pulling at the line would be super helpful. I know it's like a dance and there's an art to it and it looks smooth and easy when watching pros. But some days it feels like I have two left feet. And this is from Kane Sauls. I, I can relate to him on that. Just not like you pros. You, you, you do it so it's just like natural to you it's like you don't have to think about it. it's like breathing but for us amateurs it's like we have to really think through this stuff yeah well it's it, eventually if you do it enough it becomes second nature and hopefully somebody sure. teaching you how to do it right because because if you keep doing bad habits and bad it just you just end up being bad i mean yeah i do talk to my dogs um usually i have i, I i'm not a real loud handler when i talk to my dogs the line if I'm walking to the line and I say heel, um, I, I usually comes with a correction after, if they don't hurt. Because here's the thing. It's a heel, 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 heel. That doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't hear you after the first one. So if you're going to walk to the line and you say heel, and you to, if you have to say it again and you're in training, that's what the collar and, and our healing sticks for. Use that thing. So when you say heel, it means something. Okay? Biggest thing. Sit. It means something. Heal, it means something. So those are obedience commands. If you heal, heal, sit, 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 sit. Well, if you said sit five times or not sat, then what are you doing, right? Um, so if it's, a, if it's an obedience command, make it come with some sort of a um, correction. Say heal, you walk to the line. And a lot of times when I walk to the line in training, I don't even say anything. They need to be with me. And if they're not with me, then they get a correction. They know to heal with me in the line. I don't have to say it. They they know it. So if I say, you know, come out, come out holding my say heal, and if they don't heal with me worth a damn, then they get a correction. We gotta work on that, you know, make those commands come with some sort of a correction. Um cues at the line, you know, you can say mark, you know, depending on if you're doing field trials, hunt tests, you're gonna say sit, you know, or if you're doing let's just say you're doing a walk up. I'm doing a walk up, I'll say heel, and I'll be walking along a heel, and now I'll go watch, watch. I'll say that. Now they're paying attention to something popping out. I watch. You know, that's what I say if I'm on a walk up. Um, you get to the line, you can say sit. Um, you can either you can say mark, you can do whatever you want to do. Line them up for the mark they're looking at and say mark, good, mark, good, mark, right there, mark. Um I do that. My blind blind command sequence is, you know, I 
Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. Depends on the dog. But I'll come in, I'll say, sit. And I'll say, dead bird. And I'll say, here, right there, good. If they're looking where they need to be, good, right there. If they look to the left, I'll say, if they're left hand healing dog, they're looking to the left, no, here, here, good, sit, sit, good, sit, right there, right there. If they're looking to the right, no, heal, heal, good, sit, right there, sit, good, sit. And I, that, I talk them into it. Same way with marks. If they don't see a mark, or even if they do see the mark, and I want them to, this is where you need to go, where's that mark at? Where's that mark at? Good, right there, good, right there. And I kick them off. It's the same. You talk them into that spot, right? Some people will say way out. I don't say way out. Um, my, vo my voice cues are usually a soft, say it's a retired bird or a really short check down bird. And I, I don't put my hand down during that. And I'll say easy, easy, flash. I'll give a real small, easy, quiet send. If it's a, if it's a longer, you know, bird that you know, want to poke out there this is where you could have used this with georgie on that test in the third series mm -hmm. you picked as if you had picked up the right mark the go bird then say you'd have picked up the left mark and then that long punch bird up the middle you would have said where's that mark at where's it at and look out there you're good right there and you drop your hand good right there right there and you go georgie and you, that that tells them that longer more inflection drives them you're telling that you're actually i want you to go farther so I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So my voice, my voice is, is it tells them kind of almost like a distance, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. A louder, longer reflect voice inflection means you go farther. Quieter, softer means you go, go shorter. Um, poison birds, I don't get in a big deal. Right I see people go, no, no, I don't do that. Um, I just, you know, pull them off here, 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 dead bird. You know, we work on that in training. Now, if I say here and I pull you off a poison bird and, I, and they look out there at the blind and they get back and they try to run back to poison bird, they get in trouble. No, here, come here. So I don't get in that whole no, no, I don't, I don't do all that. Um, but I try to keep, you, you know, you try to keep your voice commands down to a minimum because the more you talk, the more commands you give, the dog just quits listening to you after a while. Just like um, always. Just yeah, it's just kids. noise. It's just, yeah, this just doesn't make any sense to them. But, um, and you know, our feet, uh, I I see a lot of people with a left-handed healing dog, their left foot's forward. Get that thing out of there. Um, get that, you know, stand in the middle of the dog um, and get that left foot back, and you'll drive with your right foot. You know, if you push your right foot more to the left, it'll turn to the left. You pull the right foot back, they turn to the right. Give them their shoulders that they can turn and look and see what they got going on. If you're if you're off with your left foot forward and you kick them off, a lot of times your dog will flare to the left because you got to get out of the way of your foot of your leg. So get yeah, that. That's out. one of the first changes you made with me is she's yeah. a right healing dog and I had my yeah. right leg front yeah. and she couldn't move. And yeah, that made a huge difference right off the bat. That made a big difference. Yeah, for sure. My legs. You're not crowding them. You're not crowding them as much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I meant to ask you um, uh, when you're talking about healing is I'm having problems. So she wants to crowd me a little bit when we're in hunt tests. And when I really get serious with the heel, she's trying to heal so hard. She's like crowding me and her like her, her head's like into my knee. And I'm just trying to kick her with my knee when she does it. She, I, I wish she'd give me a tiny bit more space. Well, really she's just trying to be a good dog. And as long as you're not encouraging that, you're not going to get in trouble for her. At least she's at least she's healing. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't worry about it as much. You know, you can push her away with your leg, you know, but yeah. um, if she's just, after you press, you have to probably be giving her a correction. She's probably trying to do that. I'm just afraid I'm going to like step on her foot or her leg. Or well, something. that's like, whatever. Like, step on her foot. And then she'll move. Yeah, I guess it's move. the hot stove right there. Yeah, it? that's that stove's hot. Let's do this one from Wayne Lindsay. What are some handling and lining drills besides wagon and tea drills? Okay. Um, you know, wagon wheel is more of a lining communication drill. The T drill is, is a, is a handling drill. It's not a lining drill. Um, you can do walking baseball for, you know, some handling type stuff. You could do pattern blinds for handling type stuff. We you like to do pattern. What that baseball one is. Oh, that, that's going to be such a hot shit. I never even said that dang thing, but that's yeah, where you walk away. You I, look it up. <laughs> so, oh man. I, it's, yeah, if you want to know what walking baseball is, look it up. It's going to be right. that's thirty minute explanation. But yeah, let's um, do that. I, we do pattern blind lining and casting. 
where you have, you know, like a, you have a crow's foot, you have like 10, 12, and 2, and you line them all, and then you stop them, you send them to 12, stop them, you angle cast to 10, angle cast to 2. You can bump around through all of that. Um, once the dog is through pattern blinds, I don't, I very seldom do handling drills with an advanced dog. Um, I run a lot of cold blinds, and I keep a really high standard. So once they're advanced, so I don't do a lot. Of, I don't go back to a lot of handling drills. I run a lot of cold blinds, keep a high standard. So okay. you can run lots of blinds off. You know, runs a run tight blinds off the same location, the same line. But like I said, once the T drill is done, you're through patterns and you're through all that stuff. Now a good a good water drill is a tune up drill, where you angle across this water. You're, you're it's a handling drill and you're angling across this water. And teaching corners and, and keeping straight lines. That's a that's a really good drill too, to, especially in the water. And then you can do no no drills. Those are always good too. All right. This one, I have not heard you speak to this. This is Eric Nelson again. One for the podcast. How would you consider the effective use of decoys in a training setup for both land and water and how they can be used to influence or create distractions? Yeah, we like to use decoys that we put them in line to marks to throw them off their line and in line to the blind to throw them off and off, off on the line of the blind where it almost makes you handle them. They have to handle. And also if you're teaching a dog to check down on a short mark, you have a dog that struggles with checking down on a short mark. Let's just say that marks at 50 yards, right? Put your decoys at 75 yards behind that mark. So, the go birds at 150, you come in, you pick that up, you come back, you try to, you know, check it down to 50, put your decoys at 75 yards behind your 50 yard mark. And if they, they, it draws them, you know, that dog is drawn to those decoys. So it's te those decoys are pulling that dog out of that area of the fall. So you can do a lot of things with decoys, or you can put, if you really want to be mean, you can put a white decoy off the side on a mark. It's out of, you know, if it's, they got to go over a hill or a piece of water, put a decoy off to the right distraction that you don't see and draws them over there. You can do a lot of things with decoys, but like I said, the most things we use are blocking the lines to marks and blind and, or putting like, say a long memory, say a long memory bird that's thrown right to left. And you have a dog that has a tendency to run towards decoys, then put those decoys to the right of the mark on the other side, on the back side of holding blind, teach them to stay out of there and run to the mark. You know, there's a lot of things you can do with decoys. All right, you want to do one more? One more. All right, this is Walter Brown. He's actually a friend of mine in my area. And his dog's a little older than this now. This is kind of an old one we never got to, but this is still a good topic. Um, he has a six-month-old puppy that will not get in the water. Any suggestions? Before you answer, let me tell you what I've already tried. I've waded into the water using my duck hunting waders and invited him to join me. That didn't work. I've thrown... A little short retrieves into the water and encouraged him to retrieve those. That didn't work. I've had other dogs, including some mature dogs and some puppies, play around with him and play around in the water. And I have had him watch them retrieve and go into the water, hoping he would join in. That didn't work. I have thrown dummies, dokens, and everything else into the water. That didn't work. Also took a live bird, jazzed him up with it, then dizzied the live bird, threw it into the water to see if he would go for the live bird in the water. That didn't work. I'm halfway through at this point. I'm at my wits end here and really getting worried about this water attitude. He generally will come to the edge of the water, put a couple toes in, bark at the water like he really wants to get in, but he's afraid to do so. So far, he is seriously reluctant to get in the water. I've had him in a few times just by putting him in the water, not dragging him in, but just getting him to the edge and coaxing him to come in deep enough to where he has to swim. He swims around frantically and doesn't necessar necessarily right himself or balance himself and then heads straight for the shore every time I let him go. I guess what I really want to know is he's going away to the pro trainer in about a month. At that time, I, it may be too cold to even try to introduce him to water. And so if he doesn't get in the water and start retrieving in the water until next spring, when he'll be almost a year old, will that be okay? Or should I try to get him into the trainer somewhere down south and keep trying the water introduction thing? Just FYI, he's done well with everything else. Retrieves at about 75 yards or more. Does obedience okay. Very athletic, bold, driven, and confident in every other way. Just the water thing. Thank you for your help. 
Sorry for the long post. Well, what has happened to that dog since? He says he's a buddy of yours. Well, and he just got him back from the trainer, and we are going to get together for a training, but I have I, I assume he's been in the water. He, he didn't mention anything to me about it. I How long was you with the trainer? Um, Quite a while, because that was a long time ago. That was before, right towards last fall, and he's just getting it back. So he must have been with the trainer like October, November, December, January, February. So unless they were four deep, or five deep, months. Unless they were deep, deep south, they weren't in the water. I'll have to ask him. Where'd that dog go? Deep south somewhere? Mm, I don't know. He hasn't been in the water unless he went to deep south. So um, this is not a good, this is, if you want to hunt test dog and or a really good waterfowl dog, this is a huge red flag. I, I'm just going to tell you how it is. This is not probably a good thing. Um, it may end up being a new dog because it's scared death of water. Not all dogs like the water. I mean, mm-hmm. believe it or not, not all, they just don't. Um, one, th- if you've tried it, you've done everything in there that I would have done everything with the exception, go, this is going to sound crazy. Make sure the water is warm enough, right? Go get a life jacket for your dog. Get a boat, go out in the middle of a pond, put him in the water, put him on a leash and paddle away. Like he's healing next to the boat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now you're not throwing him in and making it like violent. He's not going to drown. He's not going to do anything. Now just put a life jacket on him, set him down in the water with a leash around a, his collar, and you're right there and you just start paddling away and like and you hold on to the leash and you encourage him, you know. And if he likes bumpers, if he likes bumpers or birds, once he calms down and he's doing it. Maybe throw a bumper in front of him, you retrieve it and take it and ah boy, that boy, good, good, good. Then you associate good things with it. But he may be able to float good enough to actually tread water and swim mm-hmm. and level out. That's the only other thing that I can think of. The only other thing I can think of because he just doesn't like water. And if he, uh, that's a hard, and I hope he's in the water now. And I'm, I'd love to see what they did to him to do it. But the only thing I can think of was a life jacket and a boat right next to him and just have him swim next to you because he's you know he's he's struggling and thrashed around the water that life cycle should level him out and float him that sounds crazy yeah you know i don't think i ever read that question that question has been on here for months and we just never got to it and i never actually read it yeah so i just sent him a text i'm gonna find out because his dog just came back i think two wednesdays ago and he said hey um when next time you guys are training let me know my dog just got my dog back from the trainer so i assume he i don't know i'm gonna find out yeah I'm curious uh, about the, the, what you don't want to do is just throw it get upset throw it in the water don't do yeah. that but you know that life jacket trick um might help mm-hmm. just to get the dog confident it's not going to die yeah and, and and you're where with him and once he realizes he can swim you're like oh this isn't bad you know and yeah. if he has high retrieve desire toss a bump when he's actually swimming with the boat maybe toss a bumper and he'll go over and swim to it, and then there's a ton of joy to that, and a lot of happiness, and 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 a reward, you know. Yeah. I, I just, My first dog, I couldn't get to get in the water, and it was a really it was during the summer. It was a really hot day, so we were driving out to the lake, and I rolled the windows up, turned the heater on, and just fried us out. And we got to the boat ramp, and I took off running down the boat ramp into the water, and the dog just followed right after me, right in. <laughs> <laughs> so. The moral to the story is you both need to get close to heat exhaustion and heat stroke yeah. and then jump in the water and hope you live. Yeah. That was my method. <laughs> that, yes, somebody do not do that. That'd be great. That's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, our timbers are 105 apiece. I'm about to pass out. Let's jump in the water. Oh, I just got a response back on the text. He said, yes, he's killing it now. As I often do, I worried about it way too much. He was just a little immature and a bit of a knucklehead, but now he's doing great. Perfect. No problems great. Great. If you do, if you yeah. talk to him, just ask him how they got, he just probably grew up is all. He's just a little yeah. bit nervous about it, you know? Yep. Yeah. So, and awesome. that's when, you know, that's a lot of people like Walter and, and a lot of people I know they, they, and I was like this when I was first starting out, you thread up, you, you sweat about all the little tiny things. Everybody was worried about every little teeny tiny thing. And you know what? It's all going to probably work out in the wash. Just calm down about it. There's a lot more things to worry about than that. 
So, yeah. I mean, everybody's so worried about the littlest things all the time that um, it, it all will all work out. And just in a lot of, you know, a lot of this stuff with dogs and everything is a lot of this stuff is immaturity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they do a lot of weird things when they're immature and when they're immature and they're not thinking correctly, that's when people get frustrated and add pressure. And now they're not mature enough mentally to understand the pressure. And then it just ends up being a train wreck. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad Walter didn't get up, you know, just throw him in the damn water. You know what I mean? I've seen, uh, that would have probably done, been over it, but I'm glad he didn't do that. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's pretty good. We got through quite a few of them. So yep. we're going to need some more questions guys. So I'll, I'll put a post about it in the podcast group and, and get your questions over there. And, we'll get and I will tell you, everybody list. listening is we'll put it on the Facebook page too, but we are going to have a judge come on here. One of these podcasts here pretty soon. And um, he's judged a ton of tests, more, t- more, more tests than anybody I know. Um, and so if you've got a question about, he's an, he's a, an HRC judge and really, really good one. And if you've got questions about, you know, what a judge sees and what the judge is looking for, put that on the Facebook page and he'll have we'll answer a bunch of questions because it's, it's you know, looking through the judge's chair is going to be the podcast. And it's going to be a very, very good one. Yeah, that'll be awesome. So be watching for that. We will put that up specifically asking for those questions before we record. So be looking yep. for that. It's the Flatland Kills podcast group on Facebook. So come join it. Okay, guys. Thanks for listening. See everybody at the line. Take that in. Gotta strike this chord with the humble hearts Bearing heavy chains and blue collar scars